and I'm sure that that we'll see a few others join in the next couple of minutes. Hi, welcome everybody. So glad you're here. Um, welcome to the One Ed Tech IMS Global. We're in the midst of a name brand name change, so you'll see One Ed Tech a lot more often than you'll see IMS as we as we transition forward. Um, but you're joining today a panel session or a session on student success, a strategic view on data insights to support learners. And we're here joined by some, in, some experts in the field. Um, I'm going to take a minute and let them introduce themselves as we move through the agenda. But how this will work is we're going to hear from the three institutions. We've got um, Vince Kellen from UC San Diego. We have Robert Carpenter and John Fritz, both from University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and David Levin, Levine, I'm sorry, David, I didn't check that ahead of time, and Megan Levitt from um, University of California, Davis, and they'll take a minute and tell you who they are as they enter into their share session. But the, um, the approach that we're taking here is each institution will take about 15 to 17 minutes to tell you a little bit about their story, the what, their initiative is, the why, the how, the impact to students, students learning. And um, we're gonna leave a little time at the end for Q&A. Now, I would like to just say, um, my role is the Senior Director for Higher Education Programs, and we facilitate a number of activities around the IMS One Ed Tech community to try to bring our members together and help solve challenges. Um, one of the areas is learning data and analytics. And we have a number of groups and activities that if those of you are interested in participating, one such is our innovation leadership network that meets monthly. Very, very casual, but a great get together and share on topics around learning data and analytics. And we have the University of Michigan's My Learning Analytics queued up for June. So perhaps you might be interested in joining. And if you are, please reach out. That's for the IMS and One Ed Tech members. But if you're outside the membership and you would like to learn more, you can always reach out and talk with me about it. So um, we'll make sure you get our contact information at the end. So let me uh, let me just start in the order we're going to go through is Bob and John will kick it off. Uh, we'll then move to the University of California, Davis, and and then on to closing with Vince at San Diego. And I'll be the timekeeper facilitator. Please um, feel free to ask questions, but we do have time at the end and I'll monitor that, that um, Q&A so that we can get to them at some point um, throughout the discussion. But again, so glad you're here. Um, let me pass it on to Bob to kick it off and, and do a proper introdu introduction of yourselves. And I will pass. Well, as I, I am, I'm Bob Carpenter. I'm associate provost uh, for analytics and deputy CIO at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I'm going to kick it immediately to John, who's going to start our talk. Uh, give me one second here. All right. Can you all see everything okay? Hear me okay? Good. Yes, can okay. do. Okay. All right. So thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, Bob and I are going to do this together, but uh, I'm going to go first, but go quick. So let me let me get started. So. Uh, first of all, we'll just a uh, brief mention about our uh, brand spanking new learning analytics community of practice. Uh, this is intentionally modeled after um, really some fine work at Indiana University, but we've been doing this for about a year now. And uh, this spring, we also had a nice series of things uh, that we were able to present. And I wanted to showcase one faculty member's work as it uh, relates to how we're trying to do nudging through course design. And then Bob's going to uh, take it from there. So. Um, this is Tara Carpenter, who is a principal uh, lecturer in chemistry, teaches the largest course on campus. And among other things, what she was trying to deal with was the fact that students, especially incoming, tend to try to memorize to prepare for their exams rather than learn the material. Um, if anybody's familiar uh, with the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, uh, it is sort of the precursor of the learning curve. Uh, and she was dealing with this through something called space practice, which was intentionally uh, repeated exposure over time so that they didn't just uh, try to memorize material and go through it and then forget it as soon as the exam was done. So these were some of the problems that she was trying to do. Um, this is sort of a representation of when she first started doing this. I think it was in spring 21, yes, where every row is a student, every column is a week in the semester. 
And um, the, de the color density is um, based on the amount of time that the students were spending in the learning management system. Um, I don't need to probably tell you, but I'll point it out. Uh, this is when she introduced her space practice where the students were really spending a lot of time working on this, uh, intentionally trying to get ready for exams by solving problems that they would likely see on it. Um, this was also using uh, this for this uh, last fall and also in the spring, we were using Realize It, the adaptive learning system. And this is realize its view of that same kinds of data, uh, but for the fall term. Long story short, every row is a student, every column is a day of completed spaced practice. And what it's organized by the final grades that students earned. There's no other data here represented other than completing the practice and the final grade earned. And yet you start to see the pattern of behavior in terms of uh, the effect on outcomes. Uh, there are, you know, you know, the large number of uh, students who, you know, are, are doing the practice every day, they get the higher grades. Uh, you know, paradoxically, there are some students who are doing a lot of practice, but they're not getting the grades. And so we're digging into what some of those anomalies are, but it's kind of interesting to see how this plays out. Um, even 14 days into the term, it's 82% uh, accurate uh, in terms of predicting the final grade just based on the work that they put in. Um, wanted to just kind of show how this looked like for the fall in terms of the grade distribution. Uh, it's about in, in the fall, 200 students. In the spring, it's about 600. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, definitely not the on term, but you can start to see the patterns here in terms of, you know, just the final grades that were earned, you know, you, you know, in the past, we, we started to see that, you know, the, the lower grade shifting up certainly um, in, in the F's as well, but in the fall 21, where she kind of had her first full semester of space practice, uh, you start to see a, a different trajectory as well. The, the, what I want to do, though, is, is drill into this a little deeper by looking at this in terms of students' uh, race, uh, white versus underrepresented minority. And what you really start to notice is that the gains in the overall grade distribution were largely achieved by underrepresented minorities at the higher grade uh, grades that were earned. We think this is fascinating. Uh, this was part of a project that we're doing with Every Learner Everywhere uh, that was focused on equity in digital education. And so by bringing some of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic into uh, the return to campus, we're really interested on how um, we can design the courses to facilitate students frequent practice to get them ready for those high stakes exams. And with that, I'm gonna kind of turn things over by uh, pivoting on a particular point, and that is the obvious one. Uh, grades, while they're definitive, occur too late in the, in the term to be actionable. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. So Bob, go ahead. Thank you, John. I'm going to try to share my screen really quickly here. Do you want me to take it off? Yes, please. All right. Go for it. Don, I'm going to have to change my settings. So, can you uh, reshare and just run yeah. the run the show? No worries. So, uh, before we get going, I, I think I think one of the fascinating things in John's slide, I've seen these things several times, is that um, you know time on task seems to matter. So, my part of the university includes the data science group and some of the uh, some of the groups that um, manage and develop the technologies that. Um, deliver a, a better student experience. And, and a lot of our philosophy, I'm going to talk about nudge campaigns. A lot of our philosophy philosophy is just trying to get the right information to the right student at the right time. And as John said, grades come too late. Uh, a lot of our nudge campaigns start as early as the 10th day of the semester. We use a variety of, of tools and techniques. And I think one of the really interesting things, my home discipline is economics, is that once you pay the fixed modeling and setup costs and construct the nudges, the marginal cost of delivering uh, nudges to students is essentially zero. And so we can use IT to scale those nudges uh, it, very, very widely. So I'm gonna talk about three things fairly quickly. Um, and that is some course level nudges that we're doing based on predictive analytics, some nudges that we're doing based on historical data and fact patterns, 
and don't involve any any technical um, uh, predictive models that you could set up if you were interested in this area at fairly low cost, and then some nudges based on students' habits and behaviors. Slide, please, John. So the the first one is this uh, is a predictive model that that and the predictive model predicts failure. Uh, D a course grade of D effort W in a class. And so what we've done is this is what in what I would call expanded pilot. Uh, we focus on some courses where A, the instructors are willing to work with us uh, in the departments. Uh, and they're also uh, foundational courses in a lot of the STEM disciplines uh, that could restrict students or obstruct students' path to degree. And for us, so we're looking at high DFW classes, so high fail rates, large numbers of students, uh, students who use the learning, uh, students in courses that use the, 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 the learning management system fairly intensively and are foundational. Uh, John, slide, please. So uh, this is just some of the setup. Um, you know, basically the, the key point is the third bullet here. We create predictions with data up to week four, and then we create a second set of predictions uh, in week seven of the semester. And we, we classify a student as likely to fail if there's if the model predicts a greater than 50% probability that they'll fail. Slide, please. These are some of the interact or some of the features in, in the in the model. Uh, if you're not a data scientist, you would call these variables. Um, just there are four big categories. I'm not going to go through any of these things um, in any detail. It just kind of shows you the range of things that we're looking at. Uh, includes demographics, interaction data, things about the course, and the student's historical performance. And uh, while you're sort of quickly glancing through these things, you might think, because the next slide is going to show you what the most important features are, the five most important features at week four and week seven. And if we had a lot more time, I would do an over under on which, uh, which variables you thought were most important. Okay. Uh, but here, here they are. And it's almost all time on task. Right. If you look, uh, the top five features at week four are the duration and, uh, and the recent durations of interactions with the learning management system, the total interactions and grades and course size. At, at week seven, uh, the key features are still uh, duration and recent duration, and then also um, uh, how many times a student has failed a class in, in, their, in their career at UMBC. Uh, but I think that that dovetails really well with the evidence that John showed in his two waterfall diagrams. And I just want to point one other thing out that we don't have time to talk about today in our brief, in our brief session. But if you go back and look at these slides, what you'll see is a lot of students who earn uh, Fs and Ws have essentially checked out within one month of the, the beginning of the semester. And so there, right there is a way that you can intervene with students just to see the ones who are not interacting with the LMS after the first month or who aren't engaged with adaptive learning platforms or their, or their textbooks. Slide please, John. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk just about the, the, the model itself. This model has um, a precision of about 93% and a recall of about 30%. And so if you're not a data science person, if you're not a technical person, precision just means if, if the model thinks you're going to, if the model predicts that you're going to fail uh, about 93% of the time, it's going to be right. Recall, another word for recall is the probability of detection. So the model detects about 30% of the people who are going to fail. So it, it delivers a lot of, um, in this case, uh, false negatives. But that's a, what, when you're modeling, you can kind of, choose thresholds that change these two things. What we decided to do as a matter of philosophy was to, is, was to increase precision so that instructors would have, at, at the expense of higher recall or at the expense of a higher probability of detection, simply so that instructors would be more confident in the results that we were giving them. Now, slide please, John. Now, one of the inter interesting things here is that the nudges come over the signature of their faculty member and the nudges are delivered in the form of what we call a personal post or an email uh, that in its subject line says your grade in pre-calculus, your grade in calculus. And then again, it's over the instructor's signature, which really we thought mean would make it much more likely for students to pay attention to the nudge. And we're following best practices in this area. The nudges are empathetic. Uh, and we share no information about 
the fact that a, a predictive model is suggesting that they might fail. We don't give any information out about that. These are just uh, how you doing. It's I want to reach out to you, and, and if you, John, if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that the nudges change from uh, from week four to week seven. In week four, the instructor reaches out to the student. In week seven, they write in a way uh, that suggests it's a follow up message. And some students, we have a manual early academic alert. That's what EAA stands for. Uh, and where instructors uh, tag students between the sixth and the ninth week of the term to see uh, the, if, if they think that the student is going to fail the class. And so for students that the predictive model suggests failure and the instructor thinks there's danger of failure, uh, the probability that the student's going to fail the class is very high and they get a, 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 a different nudge. John, slide, please. And all the nudges have uh, what John calls a, a call to action. And um, there are nudges basically pushes students to use uh, different uh, resources that they could use to imp improve their performance. Uh, the line I like is uh, the prior successful students have told me that uh, the most effective thing that they can do is talk to their instructor or their advisor. But then we also allow them uh, uh, directly through the email to uh, schedule tutoring appointments or SI pass sessions. Slide, please. Now, that's the sort of the basics of the nudge. I wanted to show you that the open rate for these nudges is pretty high. It's certainly high relative to direct mail, but it's even high relative to other things that we do at the university. They're about 80, 86 to uh, 80, 80 to 90 percent of the students open the, open the message and, and, and read it. On the far right-hand column, that interaction rate is the percentage of students who actually follow one of the links in the email uh, to uh, consume some sort of support service. And I think that those numbers are fantastically high because nudges aren't necessarily supposed to operate. Uh, uh, they operate on a large number of people in, in, in an attempt to get a small number of people to change their behavior. Uh, these these seven to eighteen percent interaction rates to me are, are quite large. How am I doing on time? Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so um, just really quickly, because I couldn't hear anything you said, Andrea. So maybe just hold up a number or two. <laughs> two minutes. All right, I got that. Um, I promised a second uh, to tell you about a second nudge campaign that we're using that looks at historical data, but is easy to implement and you can start it right at the beginning of the semester at UMBC. Uh, what we found in our math class is that about one out of three people who are taking a foundational math class fail it, uh, which is, I think, in line with other public universities. But what people don't necessarily know is that repeating the class uh, is associated with high failure rates as well. One out of two people who repeat a class fail it. And when we look at our class rosters, about 20% of, of, of any foundational math class is comprised of people who are repeating it. So that's, that's not really good in any dimension, right? You've got high initial failure rates, very high uh, fail rates for repeaters, and a large number, a large amount of your total bandwidth is, is being consumed by people who are repeating classes. But we found only one out of every 10 people um, taking a class for the first time or as a repeater uh, use math tutoring. And so then we, and, and so what we've done is a little bit of work. It turns out that tutoring is associated with a 20% decline in fail rates for repeating students. Uh, and this is adjusting for selection bias. And so when, what we do is on the 10th day of the term, if you're repeating a math class, you get a nudge that basically says, look, we notice you're repeating this math class. There's a free effective resource, uh, math tutoring, it's it, you know, it's use it and that 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 email goes out to them right after the tutoring center opens at the beginning of the semester and then around the time of the first midterm and we've had a lot of success with that um, and then uh, I think I'm about out of time so John um, mm -hmm. could you just fast forward to the end please yeah yeah so our general philosophy is is just to, to use technology to scale nudges to use uh, both uh, simple and more sophisticated techniques to uh, direct those nudges to the right people and to, 
to provide those nudges as early as we can to allow students to have more time to correct to, to correct their courses. It doesn't do any good to tell a student uh, in, this, in, the, in the ninth week of the semester that they have a failing grade uh, because uh, you're basically saying if you get an A for the rest of the term, you probably still won't pass the class. And so the whole philosophy is right message, right person, right time. And with that, uh, that's John and I right there. Um, you know, thanks for your time. Wow, that's excellent, excellent presentation and really insightful, interesting, very fascinating. I'm going to pass it on to Megan right away, and then we're going to we're going to little claps happening throughout the. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Megan, and we're going to we're going to go through the rest of the presenters, and then we'll open it up for questions either through the uh, online forum or we'll unmute and we can have some Q and A that way as well. So Megan, let me pass it on to you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Bob and John. So I'm Megan Levitt. I'm an assistant vice provost and associate chief information officer at the University of California at Davis. And I'm joined today with David Levin. And he is going to share our slides for you. So I'll just wait a minute while he pulls that up. All right, next slide, David. So we are very at, um, well, wait a second until it, it's not forwarding for me, David. So. There we go. So um, I will share that at UC Davis, I would say we are very nascent in the uh, learning analytics conversation. So we have very robust use of student information systems. We have great adoption of the LMS in the, in the low 90s percent. Um, so we have a really um, ripe environment for, um, for understanding more about our students and and helping them be successful and use the data. So um, in order to, to do that, we feel like we need to, we, we also have a very decentralized um, type of campus culture. So we're thinking about how do we democratize the data so that we can make it more available in all these unique different programs so that they can find their way. And our strategy is to help them find a story with the data that they can then share with campus leadership so that we can start hopefully a snowball effect and um, start to increase the use of learning analytics on campus. So one challenge I have is um, finding staff time to dedicate to this initiative and learning analytics in general. And David is uh, our Director Emeritus of Academic Technology who retired almost two years ago now. And so um, I took advantage of that to ask him to stay on and serve um, in this space because it's so important to move the university forward. And we really need someone who has been, um, who could dedicate the time to um, the strategies for campus. So um, David has been working on our learning analytics initiatives um, for, for the last couple of years. So I'm gonna turn it over to him to kind of share two of our stories um, from his work. Thank you, Megan. Uh, yes, we are somewhat uh, nascent and I, I was really impressed with what John is doing. And I know a lot of what Vince is doing. So, so uh, hopefully this story will help you see uh, what happens is someone, as some um, universities start to get going. So one of the things that we had to think about at first is what is learning data? And, you know, we have a pretty robust, as Megan mentioned, process for using student information data, but we're, we don't for learning data. So we had to kind of think about what it is and everything. And of course, learning data is everything that we, uh, where we interact, where our students are interacting with technology or, you know, maybe even not with technology if we can collect the data. Uh, we have some interesting things there with, with one of our partners. Um, so it's discussion tools, learning management tools, et cetera. Uh, who uses it? Well, as uh, the previous example showed, it's really, you know, we, we in um, academic technology especially are very focused on faculty and serving faculty because we help our students through helping faculty. But there are also uh, advisors who are very interested in learning data and departments and administrators. One of our interesting early cases is really serving departments rather than individual faculty, as I'll show you. The cases that we're going to um, look at are first some reports and data that are used directly by faculty. Then we're going to look at how we've been using some learning data, some outcomes data from Canvas for program assessment, even all the way up to accreditation. 
Uh, and if there's time, we'll talk, talk a bit also about kind of some of the, the um, learnings that we had in this environment. Uh, many of us in the, on the academic side of things are somewhat new to um, finding ways of using data in some of these ways. And so we had some things we learned about that, about the process and, and issues of privacy and, um, uh, and security, for example, that we have to, that we had to pay attention to. One of the early wins that we had in um, use of data for faculty is in the area of video. We're a pretty heavy user of um, lecture capture. We have lecture capture uh, technology in really at this point, most of our classrooms, our faculty are using it heavily. When we first started using it, faculty wanted to see, well, what can we learn about our students who are using this? One of the things that they, to be honest with you, that they were very interested in early on was what can we do to make sure that students are attending class, not just viewing the lectures um, online? But as we started looking at how to share data with them, one of the things that they were really impressed with was looking at how students are using the videos where they found, for example, um, or they, they heard that a lot of students were replaying some parts of the video, watching some of the video at double speed, et cetera, things like that. So we were able to uh, produce some data for them that shows minute by minute um, interaction of the students with the video. These reports are now built into some of the lecture capture uh, technologies. When we first started out on this, we had to program it ourselves, but our faculty were extremely interested in this because then they, they could then watch the five minutes that every student was watching three times and figure out, oh, that's the thing that's stumbling them and figure out how to improve their instruction there. So that was a, a really early win for us in getting faculty to think about how to use some of the data that we're collecting. One of the things that we, uh, we have a partner, um, I'm in academic technology. We have a partner, it, which is our, our Center for uh, Educational Effectiveness, basically our, our teaching support center um, that supports faculty and graduate students especially. Um, and they've created something called Know Your Students. And we feed a lot of student information system data into that. So for example, they can tell the racial breakdown of the students, what, what are, the, um, uh, are the majors of their students in their classes and things like this. We're beginning to think about how to feed some of the learning data into that. For example, if they're using video um, uh, lecture capture, can we feed in this information about what minutes are being watched most to them? So there's a lot of keen interest in increasing the data that we can use there. Um, now, one case that I think I wanna highlight is our use of uh, Canvas data, Can Canvas outcomes data to look, at, um, to look at program assessment and even up to and including accreditation. Why do we wanna do this? Well, one of the things that we want to make sure we can do that assessors have, have told us they want to do is they want to make sure that the collection of assessment data is within the course not something bolted on or something like that so what we wanted to do was um, work with faculty and with programs to identify um, the uh, and articulate the program outcomes we work first with some uh, programs in in um, engineering because they live by the ABET standards. So they already have their outcomes well articulated. What they needed to do was, was identify what uh, outcomes should be matched with different courses and then embed uh, assignments within those courses that help us understand whether the students are achieving the outcomes. So we had to do that. Then they trained uh, graders to assess, to use uh, can Canvas rubrics to assess the um, uh, whether the students were achieving their outcomes, collected that data from Canvas, loaded it into Tableau, and then produced some reports showing attainment of those outcomes. Here's what the, you know, this is just a, a sample of what, what uh, the raw data looked like as students um, as they were collecting 
data by student of how well they achieved the different elements of a particular learning outcome. That results in a, uh, on a chart like this that shows what percentage of students are achieving the various elements of, a, uh, of the learning uh, outcome that, that we were looking at. So that's been uh, fairly successful. Um, and we can talk about that in questions if you have. And one of the things, if we have some time, I'll talk a bit about some of the initial learnings we had, some of the stumbling blocks I'd say we had as we were rolling out our um, use of learning data more and more. Um, one of the things is what are the roles within data governance for the, the different groups? Um, we have the data owners and in this case for for our learning data, it's largely instructors and students. And I would say um, in, in many ways, uh, faculty are kind of the, the center of this for us because it's their course. And to some extent, it's their interaction with the students that's most important. The, but then there's a question of who should give permission to access the data and to use the data for analytic purposes. And that's the data, what we call the data proprietors, those responsible for uh, deciding who can, um, or when there's a request to use data, who can use that. Data stewards, I think of those of us who maintain the data as the data stewards. So we in academic technology are the data stewards for learning, for most of our learning data. We house it, we deliver it, et cetera. Now, what are the strategies and challenges that we've um, encountered? Well, one thing that we had to do was understand what is our role as the data steward? Uh, we're responsible for the data integrity and security of the data. We're responsible for delivering it to approved users, but we don't own the data and we're not responsible for approving use of data. So we've got to work that out. So we, one of the things that we've been working with our data governance folks with here on campus is who's the data proprietor uh, and who's the owner for our um, Canvas data, for our learning data. And then we've also had to think about who, um, what partners we need to uh, build our system, et cetera. And the most important partners, some of the partners that we have are uh, those who, um, our business analyst units that have warehouses for the data and, and data environments. Um, we have our centers for student for excellence in teaching, like our uh, center for educational effectiveness that I mentioned that, that maintains our Know Your Students application. And of course, advisors um, are important um, partners here because one of the uses of this data is that we are very keenly interested in is building um, early warning systems and the like that can inform not only students and faculty that they, uh, they need some interaction like the nudges that were mentioned, but also uh, advisors. Our academic advising community is very interested in that. And one of the things that we're, we're still working on, I would say, is identifying and developing a data request process. Uh, one of the, the I would say, uh, um, uh, a, um, a pitfall we kind of, I would say, almost fell into and are, are have to, I think, have to be careful about is we have a, a well-oiled uh, machine for delivering student information system data. But that's built on the model that kind of, I mean, in a sense, the, the ultimate proprietor of all this, this data for students is going to be the, probably the provost or some equivalent of, of the provost on our campus. Um, but the provost isn't gonna get into the nitty gritty of, of approving different process, di different requests for use of data. So we've got to find the right um, person or office to do that. In the case of student information data, the, um, the registrar seemed like the likely choice and that's what we've been doing here. And there was, as we started rolling out our thoughts about learning data, the immediate response of many in the data governance community was, well, isn't this student data just like uh, student information data and can't we have the registrar handle it? Uh, that may not be the model that we need because it is faculty data 
as much as it is student data, and maybe maybe it is it is uh, maybe it, the, the um, proprietorship needs to live more within the academic side of things. Uh, so, what's our our data request process? We uh, have a we uh, there needs to be some sort of request form or request process approval by the proprietor and their designee. Two other pieces that we have found very important on our campus, at least, has been um, the need for a privacy review in some cases to make sure that that student data is protected and security review. Just a, a, a mention on, um, on uh, the privacy issue. Uh, one of the things we, we ran across very early on is uh, our default idea that the faculty member owns the data in a sense and ought to have access to all the data for their course is an interesting one. It probably makes a lot of sense, but within Canvas at least, there are tables within the data, if we were to give all the data to a faculty member, that maybe they shouldn't see. For example, some students may not want to, faculty to know the IP address that they are, uh, they are, um, uh, are um, coming from, and does the faculty member need to know that? Some students uh, work at, do most of their work at two o'clock in the morning. Maybe they don't want their faculty member to know that they do. So I, these are some of the things that we, we thought we had to look at. Um, and I think that's, I've come to the end. Nope, you have you have a couple minutes yet. Just a, just a, about a, in between a minute or two. So please go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, but I think I, that's I'm I'm done with All my right. presentation. Well, thank you very much, Megan and David. This was really interesting to see where you are at on your journey. As you can see, everybody is going to have their own their own journey and their different drivers for what needs to be your focus. So we're going to more claps. Thank you very much, um, Vince. I'm going to move on to you and uh, let you introduce yourself as well, if you don't mind, just so folks know your role. Yeah, and I have a screen to share here too. Uh, Vince Kellen here. I'm the CIO, CIO here at UC San Diego. And I'm going to share a little bit about uh, UC San Diego and what we've been up to and what some of our priorities were. So let's see if my screen share will work. Looks like you can see that. It's coming, yep. Yeah, Thank for, you. and to understand where we're coming from, at least for our university activities is, we're an institution that has close to a 90% six-year graduation rate and an average high school GPA coming in of about 4.0 with an effective floor of about 39385. So our, our problem isn't so much student retention, but it is a bunch of other things, which I find fascinating. Uh, having worked in institutions that had these six-year graduation rates in the you know 50s and 60 percentage where uh, retention is a really hot priority. What has been a top priority for our institution uh, for the last several years, and it's sort of behind us now, is improving our student time to degree. Uh, so students were taking, you know, five, maybe six years to get out. We're trying to shrink that down to well into the average of four to four and a half years. A lot of that work is behind us, but it did spur a lot of analysis of student data pathways uh, and bottleneck courses, which you'll see a little bit uh, uh, coming up. And uh, we've also been using a predictive model to predict uh, the student's ability to graduate in four years uh, based on a collection of data that is somewhat, some behavioral based, uh, some of it is based upon the student uh, grades and records uh, that's updated continually and fed back in uh, to our data, data warehouse environment. Uh, and that helps guide some of the advisor discussions. We've already had that in place for a number of years. Uh, by the time we step into um, our, our more learning analytics journey. Another interesting use case that we're working on is making sure we can uh, uh, assure that our students are complying with financial aid law. So this is a kind of an interesting use case where we're combining Canvas live event data uh, with our regular SIS data uh, in a workflow designed to alert the student and a financial aid that somebody is about, not, about to fall out of compliance with, with financial aid law. Essentially, they haven't participated meaningfully uh, within the course. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, we have an ongoing program that's spawning certainly out of our time degree on how to improve curricular pathways for students. This also could reach down into the, uh, the high school realm and the pre-college realm as well for how do we make uh, our courses and some of our pathways available that's gonna lead to further analysis. We've had for some time now um, a rather robust group of faculty members who do research into learning and learning analytics. This next academic year, we're turning on a service where faculty and students can request anonymized data sets from our, our, our platform, the Student Activity Hub, that are fully anonymized uh, and ready to go. And that's gonna be kind of interesting uh, to watch that unfold. The other big strategy we have for university is the continued blending of matriculated and non-matriculated students. We have a rather robust uh, extension program that is now tightly integrated with our, our EDC, our provost office. Their IT unit is now actually part of our IT unit. And we're busy conceptualizing how we're gonna merge this data so we can look at student success and student progress across both of these. We have regular students, matriculated students who take extension and vice versa. The big thing that we've been doing last uh, six years uh, has been the continued management of our platform that combines all student data into one environment. Uh, and this includes standard CIS data, the generation of our census-driven retention and enrollment numbers, our graduation numbers, um, all of the student credit hours and official grades, as well as all of the learning analytics, as well as events from our virtual advising center and other tools. Uh, that now are residing in one environment. And that's been really helpful because now we can mix and match between the two data sources. As you're seeing in this financial aid, here we're, com here we're combining financial aid data with CIS data, with Canvas data, in order to build alerts that are real-time based upon the student's submission of assignments in Canvas. Uh, the way to think about our platform is, is kind of the visual representation what I just discussed, where we're combining um, in the upper right-hand corner all the institutional analytics that an IR chef would normally do, along with the learning analytics, with the academic what we'll call operational analytics, things a department or an academic division will be very interested in, and then different engagement analytics, uh, and most notably our advising interaction uh, tool uh, for which we're streaming in events from that. This technical environment looks kind of like, uh, it's, it's actually a combination of a data lake and a data warehouse all in one. We're using very extremely affordable and extremely fast uh, uh, analytical environment called SAP HANA. Right now we have about 1.4 billion rows of caliper events uh, that are coming from our Canvas uh, instance also from our open edX platform, which we use for some of our online non-matriculated students. Uh, we've written some uh, extensions to that, and those are actually available at GitHub. And then also from our virtual advising center, we've been receiving Kaltura events, we just haven't done the analysis yet. Uh, what's also interesting is we have a rendering of that Caliper event in its original raw format in a Google BigQuery environment where we're unlocking the JSON and JSON machine learning type capabilities in Google BigQuery, as well as what we're doing in our HANA environment. Uh, and so we're now getting into different ways of structuring the data in different tiering and cost profiles. I'm gonna go through a couple of things that our user community has done with the data. This is kind of a simple one and kind of a classic one. It's uh, an instructor looking at some courses and looking at uh, the days of the week and the hours of the night to understand when activity is occurring and able to sift and sort across different uh, event types from if an announcement's being looked at, if a course has been updated, if there's been a, 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 a course grade that's been viewed or a, 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 an assignment that's been submitted, uh, those can all be filtered for and looked at. Uh, across the board. And that's just standard, how, uh, what's the heartbeat of my course? This is a little bit, I won't go into it too much here on our uh, commencement of ac academic activity project where we're taking the Canvas data, the financial aid information in order to build a uh, real-time alert uh, to financial aid in the student 
you, know, you better submit something or you're going to lose your financial aid. This is an example of a bottleneck course which hit the rounds in the last couple of years uh, as we were trying to address some of our time to degree problems and find courses that are you know, kicking students out a little bit too much. Uh, and that's an ongoing report that, that will get referenced over time. As part of COVID, we started to look at the two points in our the last couple of years of COVID. And one of them was in 2020 when everybody was remote. And then in 2021, we brought people back. The scatter plot, which you might have a hard time seeing here on the right, is 2020. And you see the slope of the line that, that represents the balance between passive events and active events. We had scored events in the Caliper standard as being passive, meaning I'm reading, active versus I'm submitting or authoring. And we looked at all of the courses for the particular term. These are all events, so it's several hundred million events in it. And then we also looked at the 2021. And you can see right away that the line is tilted more towards active events in the Canvas LMS when the students were back on campus, which surprised us. We were afraid of a drop off in uh, Canvas usage. We didn't see that. What we saw was a continued increase and actually a, con a continued interactivity level. But there's a cluster of courses here that I'm putting my mouse around here in the upper left hand uh, portion of the right graph that had a very high count of, of uh, interactive events uh, versus passive events. And they kind of disappear in the fall. And the explanation is the very active learning uh, version of that class was done in the classroom and not in Canvas. So that makes sense that they were missing. Uh, and so this was just fascinating uh, analysis to look at. We were also looking at this at kind of a day of the term. So these are to the same periods of time, fall 2020 on the bottom, fall 2021 on the top, looking at each day of the term normalized by the day of the term. Um, so you got, uh, uh, excuse me, a week of the term, well, actually week and day, week zero, day one, uh, week one, uh, day one, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that the overall level of events is about the same. And the yellow dot represents the amount of events per day per student, accounting for differences in the student population. We had more students uh, in one term versus the other. And that was just slightly higher in 2021 than 2020. Again, another way of saying we didn't see any decrease in interactivity in the adoption of the LMS. And we were doing this because we had just moved to the Canvas LMS literally six months before COVID hit. We had completed our transition from Blackboard to Canvas. And we were curious as how COVID might drive some of the Canvas adoption. This is one where somebody's looking at in my class uh, at around day 25, which students increased their interactivity in the class, which students decreased their interactivity, and what majors were they? And you can see in the bottom left, it's a bunch of students in a very specific major who sort of started to decrease their interactivity in the uh, Canvas course. And here you're seeing the inclusion of major information from the CIS data along with the Canvas data in the same visual. Uh, Canvas also provides some interesting opportunities to look at um, grade distributions in the Canvas course. However, not all courses use the same type of grading scheme. Uh, they often use wildly different grading schemes. So we've been able to normalize that by looking at percent of highest grade achieved uh, which is a poor man's percentile ranking, of course, it works quite well. And now we can look across, in, the, in this case, it's one class, but we can easily look across hundreds of classes to look at the overall grade distribution. The two charts differ in only one aspect. Uh, the chart on the left has the high school GPA uh, on top of the bar that represents the grade distribution of the class. And the right-hand chart has the UC San Diego as of that term GPA. And again, you're seeing us pull data from our classic institutional retention, institutional research uh, and, S and CIS data set, along with the learning events data set to give a little more insight. 
Um, and I'm going to stop there and end with a couple of other things uh, that I do want to talk about. And I think this notion of faculty research into data is starting to come alive. Uh, more and more faculty are getting more and more interest in the learning data and publishing papers on it. And so we're putting together a staff person and about five student workers funded jointly by us and our library. And they'll be working in our HANA environment uh, to set up versions of these views that apply anonymization algorithms and specifically K anonymity, L anonymity and differential privacy, which are automatic in the environment. And thus we can prepare either live access to that data set or, or give them data access to an anonymized data set without doing a whole lot of uh, you know, manual work. Uh, and so I think that's gonna be kind of interesting for us because we definitely want to uh, keep this focused on the faculty and what they need to do either in their research or to improve their particular uh, uh, you know, course outcomes they're trying to achieve in their courses. And along the way, we're making this platform available to other universities. So we've uh, onboarded UC Merced into this environment and we're now talking to University of Washington, our friends here at UC Davis and University of Denver and a couple others. Uh, and uh, you know, for us, it's been super exciting to have this volume of data with billions of rows at this level of performance with maybe a second or two even to access those billions of rows uh, without having to do much, any programming really. It's just all this, all the, all the, all, everything you saw today was pure Tableau looking at live data sets in the environment. Uh, no other real support or scaffolding. And that's important because in order for us to scale this for our institution, while we're big and it seems like we have a lot of money, we actually don't. We're the poorest $5.6 billion university on the planet. I'm gonna stop sharing here and turn it back to the group. Thank you, Vince. It's clear, you know, you're doing some really innovative work there and I and, uh, really appreciate you sharing it. Thank you. So we do, um, just as a heads up, we do have a little bit of time for questions. And um, first, let me just take a moment and thank our presenters for sharing their expertise. I'd like to also make a plug if you liked what you saw here today, too. We do have a conference, our annual learning impact conference, June 13 through 16 in Nashville, Tennessee. And we Vince and, and company has got a, a really great student success workshop planned. And we have a, a, a whole track of sessions on learning data and analytics. So please consider that if you if you aren't already planning to attend. But let me pose, I see some questions coming in. And uh, I'm going to just read that the University of Maryland, UMBC, you chose to balance precision over false positives. Can you expand on why? I would think that it would be ben that it would benefit more students to, to, to have a more false positives than high precision. Right, right. I understand. It's a good question. Um, you know, because it's so early and because our faculty were, um, I mean, we're working with faculty to try to get them comfortable with using predictive analytics to reach out to their students in, in, in partnership with them. We felt that it would be better in the early stages to have a high degree of precision so faculty would be confident that we were actually, uh, people that we predicted to fail were actually likely to fail. So it, it's, it's a choice. Thank you, Bob. The, the follow-up question is uh, for UC Davis, know your students, how granular is the data presented to the instructors at the course level offering individual demographics? Uh, it, is, um, it is at the course level, it is not granular. That is the, they do not um, get information about within this environment of the uh, demographic data about the students or um, elsewhere they can get information about individual majors, but I don't think within Know Your Students you get individual information like that. Thank you. Other questions? For... Uh, 
I have additional comments on yeah. governance with my colleagues at Davis because you know we're in UC here, which is the Garden of Eden of governance. <laughs> no matter where you turn, there's a committee hanging from a tree that you got to attend. Um, and what's interesting, we're pretty honed now on our data governance, having worked at it now six years. And we've just decided to revamp the, uh, the access to student data process and actually all our data to instead be, you know, category of privacy and sensitivity P1 through P4 focused, not domain specific. And the reason is we've just gone into so much blended analytics. We're combining student data, students who are employees, the employee data, et cetera. Uh, that we're revamping our, our request workflows so that uh, everything's geared toward the level of privacy, thus that governs the level of access, not so much the domain itself. We also crossed a bridge, a couple bridges, that it came, became clear to the institution that when it comes to students, students partake in many aspects of the university, so it's hard to say one college or one academic unit can, can only see their students and nobody else's students. So we had agreement early on, let's not go there, that's gonna to get too crazy to, to manage. And accept the fact that students flow through our institution in a myriad of ways and everybody needs to kind of keep an eye on them. Uh, and that's been very helpful to us uh, in that regard. But governance is hard and you just gotta work at it. It might take multiple years for everybody listening to kind of get the governance tuned to how your organization works. Thank you, Vince. I see a poke in the chat from Stephen about uh, contesting the, the poorest high total budget institution comment. <laughs> so um, uh, that's well deserved. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we cut nickels in half. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me see if the folks have any comments, comments, questions. We do have a little time. We, we've scheduled the event till quarter after just to ensure there was extra time for questions and, and comments, but um, but I know how folks schedules are please please um, offer them in chat through the Q&A or um, or we can unmute audio as well. I do have a question for you NBC and that is um, the over time obviously you're going to measure the effectiveness of the nudges as you develop a nudging portfolio. It'd be good to hear from you over time how that looks like it's gonna you know pay off, especially with the marginal cost being zero. It's sort of like kind of a freebie. You know, you ought to do it at least if it's gonna have a, a, even a small impact. The cost is gonna be well worth it. Yes, that is a really good point, and we've done the smallest amount of assessment on the impact of the nudges for people who repeat math courses. Uh, and those, I mean, I, I, I hinted towards the results, uh, you know, those indicate a positive lift from the nudges and from the treatment. Uh, you know, I, I've got two things, um, you know, one, we don't have $5.6 billion. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got limited bandwidth to do the assessment. And that's one of the other issues that I think that's kind of interesting in this world is that and you know, the more the more predictive models, the more nudges, uh, the more you, you deploy, the bigger your technical debt and the less time people have available to do new and innovative work. And so I'm continually sort of beating the bushes to try and get some additional capacity uh, to not just predict and deliver nudges, but to assess their impact. Let me, let me ask a question about um, the reception on campus. Oftentimes, having worked on a large university campus myself, there are varying opinions about the use of student data and, and how that should be curated and, and tended to, whether sh you should even use it or not. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering what you're hearing on, on the various campuses. What are you hearing from your constituents? Are they receptive? Are they, you know, how are you working through that? Um, let me ask Bob and then maybe Vincent, David, Megan can weigh in. Yeah, I'll just try to be brief. I mean, it's it's a it's a big place and there are a lot of different opinions and we have our, you know, sort of known people. There are people that we know aren't gonna be happy with this. Um, uh, you know, I, because I've been faculty for most of my career, it is helpful for me to sort of sell this to the institution. Um, you know, I think that, and, and we are very transparent as, as we have been today about 
what the structure of the nudges are. Um, you know, we're, you know, the provost is very committed to the idea that we are not going to deliver predictive models to people in ways that could possibly be used to advise them out of things. Uh, what we do is, what's the, what's the line I heard? We're trying to use analytics to hold doors open, not shut them, uh, and to get people to support uh, rather than to uh, give them advice that may, uh, you know, redirect their educational goals, right? And because the models just aren't that good and they're not that advanced, we shouldn't be doing that anyways. Uh, and we've been very clear about that. And I think that's helped make uh, our work, uh, it's, it's got our work a better reception on campus. Thank you. I'll jump in on that. that. And Bob brings up a really good point. And it sort of explains why over my career, I've, I've erred to the side of univariate statistics. Even if I pack a variable with inference, what I render to the community looks like a count um, because it's more approachable and less contestable on the face of it. Uh, and partly because, you know, there's nothing like data to make the heart beat faster, right? So a lot of people get uh, quite animated when you start talking about data. I think it comes out of this notion of, you know, information is power. And so the first thing we've tried to do is reset the culture here to say information sharing is power. Mm -hmm. That's a very different feeling. And so then we use the term data steward, meaning you steward the data like water, you don't hoard it, you can't pollute it, and you have to enhance it before the next person gets it. Mm -hmm. That means you're <laughs> part of a community uh, that's engaging in the data. And then the last thing I remind administrators of Faculty will have different opinions on what data they wish to see about the learner. And many of those different opinions, not all of them, but many of them are actually grounded in good teaching practices that they may wish to employ in their neck of the curricular woods. It's not fair for an administrator to allow one faculty group to have dominance over another faculty group, meaning support multiple viewpoints as to the level of privacy afforded to the consumer of the data. Now there's always a balancing act between the student rights and what I'll call even the, the, the taxpayer rights because a portion of this data is funded by taxpayers through financial aid and there's you know regulation on the books about who owns what data. Uh, so you gotta balance all these concerns while you're trying to prevent everybody's heart beating too fast that they don't want you to do anything with the data. <laughs> it's a tricky, it's a tricky, uh, you know, it's like they're threading a needle on the back of a racing horse. Just, just the quickest of follow-ups to just a piece of what you said, Matt, just now, Vince, is it, it, I, I think simple is, is really helpful. Uh, so take, uh, take the presentation that John and I made uh, today, John's presentation of those waterfall results with respect to interactions with the adaptive learning program or the LMS are really powerful and they're just counts, uh, but they also have really strong uh, potential policy implications in that if a student is, is not interacting with their class as early as one month in, they're, they're at high risk for not completing the course successfully. And that's something that everybody can see and internalize and, it's, and, and it, it squares with their intuition. And so working on things like that with faculty are, is likely to bear some fruit. It's, it's, it's harder to, um, to use more sophisticated methods, uh, you know, machine, especially predictive models and machine learning models. Uh, people don't understand what's, what, what, what's going on inside the black box. Uh, and, and I also find that there's a lot of confusion between classically trained statisticians and people who are more comfortable with machine learning models in terms of they're trying to do inference on, on a, a random forest, which just doesn't work. And the other thing that we often run into is uh, we'll show the results of a predictive model and people will say, well, tell me what the most important features are so I can filter on my students um, based on that. And that's really not the point. The point is, is to use the prediction itself, right? It's the combination of things uh, that are, that are, that's valuable to act on. With respect to a lot of our nudges, you know, it's just, 
it's just finding people who are interested in the work. John calls them the coalition of the willing. And then, you know, making the nudges and not making sure that the marginal cost of the faculty member is really low. So all you have to do to be part of our nudge campaign for predictive work or for predictive models on early alerts, all you have to do, your entire workload is to say, yes, I want to be involved in that. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Um, I want to leave room. There is a question in the chat, but I want to leave room for Megan and and Dave or David to respond to the to the topic. If you're interested. Oh, I guess I will, since Megan didn't. Um, uh, to the general question of 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 interest, and in, uh, I think there is a lot of interest among individual faculty and in. in learning more about their students and using their data to improve their courses and the like. I think that um, they need partners to do that because it's a lot of work. And so our Center for Educational Effectiveness, I think, does a pretty good job of working with faculty and we're trying to supply them with more information. I think what becomes more tricky is um, does our, there are, you know, there are groups of our faculty who don't really want to expose their course data to the university or even to their own colleagues um, as much as we would like to see. I think Vince's thought about anonymized sets of data is really critical there so that we can find ways of getting them, getting our community data that, that is consistent with our faculty's worries about uh, use of their data to the extent that uh, those are legitimate. Thank you, David. We have a, another question in the chat that uh, perhaps and several of you can address. It's, um, what are you using for nudges? LMS functionality or something like on task or homegrown? Uh, as with most people, we're using um, a lot of stuff right out of our student activity hub, but then we're feeding you know, to classic CRM tools. You know, we use Mayama, there's others out there. Uh, to do the, the, the actual mailing uh, of a particular thing, whether it's email uh, or other, other forms. And we have a mobile app where we can easily push it to our mobile app as well. So, to, you know, there's between what I call the generation of the data set needed for the nudge and then the transport of the nudge, which can be a variety of different ways. Ditto. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, I think uh, in my past experience too, I've seen CRMs used pretty widely for managing those types of campaigns and and organizing those organizing and tracking yeah. those communications. Yeah, and as a side, COVID kickstarted a bunch of this for us because we had to notify lots of people of lots of things with COVID, and so the pulling of student lists of things for different things in COVID, we're doing wastewater treatment in our buildings, and so we got to notify people in the building. All of that has kickstarted the delivery. Uh, different forms of delivery of messages to students. My uh, my concern is the sustainability of the high read rates. Um, you know, because what we've figured out is a way to get people to pay attention to the note, right? Which is to come directly from an instructor or mention a class or say something about you know things that will help you pass your class or graduate at a higher rate, something like that. Uh, and you know that gets people's attention, but it also shows other people who want to send out messages, how to get students' attention. Uh, and they, I think we have the same problem that most institutions have, which is students get a lot of emails from us. And so what we're trying to do is to come up with a list of a bunch of different, well, not a bunch, but uh, some critical notifications and uh, to not only send them as email, but to display them in the student information portal that they tend to get to, to uh, they tend to go to, to access the IMS, the LMS and the, um, and their email. And if we do that, then uh, you know, it, it, it triages the nudges, but we can also maybe build in some interactions uh, for students. Uh, and an example might be, the conceptual example might be, uh, of, you, know, you haven't attended class in the last couple of weeks, is everything okay? And uh, the radio buttons might be yes, no, or, uh, you know, I'm sick, right? Uh, but that 
those sorts of interactions also allow us to gather information and send a second set of nudges to someone. So if they're sick, we could send them a link to university, university health services. Thank uh, you, Bring. I, I, I want to create the equivalent of the howler from Harry Potter, where it's mother <laughs> screaming at you. Because for some of the students, um, the ones you want to respond are the ones who don't want to respond or who are non-responding. So the non-response bias is our problem in this research. And so the, the, I, I second Bob's note about the, the click-through rates on these things uh, and how to monitor them, think about that over time. Uh, but I would certainly love to get a tape of mom screaming at the kid. Right, a, a shove instead of a nudge, right? <laughs> like a hard shove. <laughs> I see you haven't been reading your email. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point um, that you raise because if you're a campus that is coordinated in your communications with students, you can you can be effective. But uh, I have experiences where you're uh, there are universities out there that are really federated and siloed in how they communicate with students because they're so large and and it's tough so a student might and i i remember going through this mapping some of this work myself as a student might received you know conflicting communications on the same day sometimes or you know just just the alignment can be really challenging so i'm i'm certain that that's something that folks will have to be thinking about as you have in uh, in their planning and work with these these initiatives but I know we're winding up to the last two minutes of our session, and this has been incredible. I really am um, appreciating what I'm learning from you all, too. So let me pause and see if any of the folks on the call still have another question, um, comment. Two seconds. Going once, going quite twice. Kara, I believe we have the session is recorded and we'll make that available to the folks that have registered. And uh, are there any other um, comments about, we'd, I'd love to be able to get all your slides if that's possible so that we can share them with the, with the attendees. And I just wanna say thank you. Um, thank you to the presenters and thank you for those of you who were able to attend and stay with us for the entire session. This has been just incredibly valuable and very strategic and, and just a real dense session. So thanks again. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody.